started, I know we don't have a ton of time and, um, and I'm certainly very interested in hearing uh, from you guys as well. Um, and so while uh, cameras are getting out, oh, there you go, while cameras are getting fixed, I, I want to just kind of, first of all, uh, thank you, Trish, for uh, inviting me to have a conversation with your students. I do not have a PowerPoint presentation today, and that is on purpose because I am quite sure that all of you know what an art exhibition looks like. So I don't need to show you photos of art exhibitions and I'm quite sure many of you have seen a ton of art and I'm not an artist, so I don't need to show you other people's art. Um, I just wanna introduce myself first of all. Uh, my name is Dexter Wimberly. Um, I'm an independent curator. I'm also the co-founder of uh, Art World Conference and a, and a new online learning platform called Art World Learning. Um, I also work with a number of different um, art institutions and museums as a consultant from time to time. But I wanna take a moment and kind of go back and hopefully explain why I'm talking to you today. So um, I, I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. I was born in Bed-Stuy um, many years ago. And uh, like a lot of uh, kids coming up, I listened to what my parents and relatives were saying I should do with myself. And they were all telling me that I should probably try to be a lawyer or a doctor or any of the other things that parents always tell you you're supposed to do. At least they used to tell you that, maybe not so much anymore. Um, and I believe that. So I, you know, I went to high school, then I went to college. I went to Brooklyn College, actually, and I was a political science major. And my goal was to graduate from school, then go to law school and become a lawyer. That's what I thought I would do. If you had asked me when I was 18 years old, that's what I thought my life would be. Um, but actually, uh, it was fortunate because I ended up uh, interning and then somewhat working at a small law firm in New York City while I was still in school. And it became clear to me I did not want to work in law at all. Like that was off the table. Um, and so I started thinking to myself, what is it that I actually wanted to do and what was I interested in? So in addition to being a student, um, I had also had this like and no one really knows this. Well, I guess some people know this. I don't really talk about it too much these days, but I also had this interest in music and I was part of this little like rap group and we used to perform in different places. Again, this is ancient, 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 ancient history. And there's nothing online about it. So don't even try to look. Um, and so, um, so I was interested in music and I was interested in the entertainment industry in general. And I also just because of my personal interest, I was interested in fashion. Not as a designer, I just liked clothes. So just to be to be clear. And it, you know, it was one of those things where I had to figure out how was I going to combine all of these interests and make a career out of it? Because I didn't want to just go and work at a company. So uh, I decided to do something that I didn't even think could work. Um, because of my pursuits uh, a, as a sort of fledgling musician, I knew a lot of people in the music industry. Again, when I say that, I'm not talking about like that I was hobnobbing with all sorts of like big name executives and celebrities. It's just that in the early 90s, uh, the music industry was structured much, uh, I would say it was much more intimate then than it is now. Um, and just being in New York and being out at the right clubs and being at the right events, you just met a lot of people, right? And because no one was on social media and people barely had email, if you met someone and they wanted to stay in touch, they had to give you their phone number. So it was like a different, you know, kind of like a different vibe. You would build relationships with people faster in that way. So I had these relationships with people in the music industry and I knew from watching music videos um, and watching television that every once in a while I would see certain fashion brands show up in music videos or they would show up on a television show. And I said, wow, what if I could contact fashion brands and say to them, I have relationships in the entertainment industry. Would you be interested in paying me to get your products worn by these famous people? It's called product placement. That's like the terminology for it. I didn't really have the terminology when I decided I wanted to do that. And again, we're talking about the early nineties here. But it was a way for me to uh, get my head around like starting some sort of a business within the framework of the sort of like that nexus of entertainment and fashion, like kind of getting into that, that space. And so fast forward to 1994, um, there was a company out of Detroit, name is irrelevant, but I'll say it, Maurice Malone Designs. I saw an article about them in a magazine 
And I just through pure sheer luck ended up meeting a group of guys who were friends with the owner of that company. And they introduced me to him. And within days of meeting him, he hired me as the promotions director for his company. And then about two months after that, the person I was working under was fired. And then I became the promotions director or whatever that meant because I didn't get any extra money. And then three months after that, the company went bankrupt. <laughs> Right. So to kind of show you how quickly things can happen. And that was December 1994. And I only point this out because something really interesting and terrible happened. Um, that year on New Year's Eve, about four minutes after midnight, I got hit by a car. And I point this out because it was the holiday season and I was jobless and I couldn't walk because I got hit by a car, right? So, so that's how I came into 1995, you know, feeling really great about life and myself. And so I took that moment, that down moment and said to myself, okay, what am I going to do to take control of the situation? Because clearly I don't have control over this situation. No job and I just got hit by a car. And truth be told, didn't even have health insurance. But again, I was like 21, whatever years old, like, you know, whatever. So I decided when that company came back, got back on his feet and I kept the relationship there, they offered me my job back. And I said, I tell you what, instead of hiring me, why don't you become my first client? Because I'm starting a company to do for you what I... Uh, to do for others what I've been doing for you. So if you're willing to be my first client, we can continue to work together. And that, they said yes. And that was the beginning of my first foray into being an entrepreneur. Because then I started this small company called August Bishop that was a product placement and PR firm that was working with a lot of, at the time, small brands who were interested in using the power of the music industry, music videos and certain television shows to promote their brands because they didn't have the budgets to compete with say Levi's or Nike or whatever, right? So I'm gonna skip a lot of stuff now because I've been spending a lot of time talking about the past. Um, that company grew over the course of a decade from me and one other person working with these brands that no one ever heard of and just through our own sheer will and our own, you know, I guess, you know, like uh, grit and fight, our clients grew from those unknown brands to companies like HBO, Adidas America, uh, Guinness World Records, Virgin Mobile, Coca-Cola, et cetera, et cetera. We started our business, I think, at one of the best times to have started a business. And that was in the mid 90s, right around the time when everyone was getting online heavy, right around the time when there were all these new dot coms coming up. And it was just, the economy was great. And it was just a lot of money flowing around and a lot of brands wanted to invest in marketing. And this is again, pre-social media. So a PR company or a marketing company that could help a brand get exposure through these non-traditional means was very valuable. And we rode that wave. While I was running that company, I started meeting a lot of creative people who were photographers, graphic designers, uh, fashion stylists, you name it, who are sort of all part of this ecosystem of the entertainment and sort of like, um, you know, uh, and fashion world. But as I started talking to some of these people and became friends with them, I realized that a lot of them had degrees in painting or an MFA sculpture or they wanted to pursue fine art photography, but they couldn't make a career out of it. So they would shoot sneakers for Adidas or they would you know, be styling a fashion shoot when they really wanted to be in their studio painting or drawing or doing something else. But this is just the reality of life. Sometimes you have to figure out creative ways to make a living, just like I had to figure out a creative way to make a living. And so that was very intriguing to me because my only interaction with fine art prior to that time, was just like most people, I would go to a museum every once in a while. Um, I really hadn't spent any time in galleries prior to 
the late 90s. So the art world to me was just sort of like this other thing that I could see from a distance, but I just didn't feel invested in it and that I didn't know enough about it. So it just was sort of like out there. Um, but as I spent more time talking to these artists, that's what they were, artists, who were not actually practicing their art, I found that to be like an interesting, um, sort of like an interesting result of how we can pursue one thing and find ourselves doing something else. But if we can get encouragement from someone, if someone can see our dream the way we see it, then maybe we would get the strength and the courage to actually pursue it. So I found myself having conversations with some of these folks and saying things like, well, have you tried to get a show? Have you tried to get an art dealer? Have you tried to sell your work? Have you tried to market yourself? Have you tried to write, you know, to write about your work? Like all of these questions. And I would inevitably hear, yes, I tried, but yes, I did this, but it was always like that. And when I would meet an artist that I felt was, you know, special and their work really moved me, you know, those conversations would grow into a friendship. And then as I started to become less and less interested in running an advertising and marketing agency, which is what my company had become, you know, just to kind of put it into context, I started that company in 1995, just before I turned 23. 322 around about 22 years old and I had been doing that for over a decade so I was like approaching you know 33 34 years old and I've been doing the same thing since I was 21 22 so it's like my entire life had been that and I was just interested in doing something else and so I decided that one of the things I could do for these artists that I knew is that I could start I didn't call it curating that I could start producing exhibitions. And to be honest with you, I didn't know what the hell I was doing in the beginning. Like it was just really like, uh, what do we do? Do we rent a space? Let's rent a space. Uh, we guess we send out invitations the same way you send out an invitation to a party. Okay, let's do it that way, you know? Um, even weird things like, why don't we just like rent a restaurant and put some paintings outside of the restaurant, like just put them on the wall. Like, I mean, we, you know, this was like really, you know, guerrilla kind of like, let's just make it happen kind of things. And, but then as I spent more and more time understanding what the role of a curator actually is, I started taking the potential of that as a, as a career path for myself much more serious. And so going back to say um, 2000 and, and I would say six or 2007, I started spending more time studying artists, studying the art world, educating myself on how museums function, educating myself on how schools function and in terms of higher ed as it relates to MFAs and other advanced degrees that artists are pursuing. I took my, my marketing and PR experience in the sort of consumer world and fashion world. And I really started to lean that into, uh, you know, the, the sort of the art world and academic world. Instead of pursuing clients that were making fashion goods, I was pursuing clients that were either galleries or nonprofits working in the art space. And I actually, took jobs at small nonprofits as a means of educating myself about the art world. So in 2000 and like almost a, a decade ago, I took a position as the director of communications at the Museum for African Art. Um, I had never worked at a museum before. Um, I didn't even know what the demands of a director of communications at a museum would be compared to the other things that I'd done in my life, but it was a way for me to be in the museum ecosystem and sort of learn by proximity. So it forced me to talk to people who work in development, which is fundraising at museums. It forced me to talk to people who worked in exhibition planning. Um, and it was my own sort of forced education for myself. But all the while, I'm still pursuing developing this curatorial career in the background. Um, and then sometime after that, I took a position at a nonprofit called ICI, Independent Curators International. They're based in New York. They've been around for almost 
40 years probably. And I was the director of strategic planning there, which was like a combination of marketing and fundraising. And I was there for about a year and a half. Again, forcing myself to do things that I didn't necessarily have the experience to do, uh, but I wanted the experience and I wanted to be able to sort of like understand the things that I, that I didn't know about how all of this works together and forced to deal with donors and the whole thing. And again, I keep reiterating, and I think it's important to point out all the while, in the background, I'm still curating small exhibitions because I knew that ultimately all of this was just a means to an end for that. Um, so I wanna kind of pivot a little bit here because again, there's still so much that I've left out but I don't wanna talk your ear off. I actually have some questions for you guys and I'm thinking you might have some questions for me. So at some point while I'm doing these jobs that were really just a means for me to make an income while I'm pursuing my curatorial career, which at this point has uh, given me the opportunity to work with hundreds of artists. I have probably curated, I don't know, 60 shows or something like that over the past 15 years. Um, at museums in the US and in Japan and in the Middle East. Um, my, you know, recent, I would have to say sort of like recent, most recent development in my life career-wise is that uh, three years ago, I decided to launch a new company called Art Wall Conference, which is focused on helping artists, emerging to mid-career artists, get a better understanding of the business and financial, um, I would say, you know, information they need to know in order to have a sustainable career. Um, because of my entrepreneurial background, because of the fact that I came into the art world in a very unusual way, I always think about things from the standpoint of how does this, you know, how does this last? How does this become not necessarily profitable, but how does this, how does this sustain itself and grow? And I know that artistic careers are very unpredictable. Income is unpredictable. How you advance yourself strategically is unpredictable. Even if you have a gallery representing you, that's not a guarantee of success. There are many artists who've never been represented by galleries to have careers that are, you know, to, to you know, to die for. There are artists who've been working with galleries from the beginning of their, their first day out of a MFA program and have never been without representation. There's so many different paths to success as, a, as an artist that um, I wanted to create a platform to help artists understand that, that, that they can choose their own version of success. And so that means equipping them with the information they need around subjects like taxes, and marketing and business planning and technology related issues and legal issues and trademarking and legacy planning. Um, so the conference, you know, takes the structure of what you would assume is like a typical conference structure, but over time it has evolved. And as a result of the pandemic, we had to take most of our activities online. And that's what we've been doing for the past year. And that's what this new platform Art World Learning has grown out of. Um, I guess I'm talking with you guys today um, to really sort of speak more to what your interests are and what your questions are as you pursue your career eventually um, as artists or as creative people. And so I know I covered a lot of different things and went probably in directions with this that you might not have actually been expecting, but I, I wanted to share that story because I think it's important to realize that even though you may have a goal, how you get from where you are to that place may be very indirect. And the things that might seem like obstacles could actually be opportunities. And as, as cliche as that may sound, it's actually the truth. And so I just wanna take a moment um, so we have six of you here, not counting you, Trish. We have six of you here. Um, and, I, and I'd like to just, if you could just give me, again, I know you may be shy or maybe not, I don't know. Um, just like literally a minute or less to sort of explain to me what your goals are as an artist or creative person. 
So we'll start with John O'Brien, uh, Kermac. O Is it Cermak or Kermac? Uh, Cermak. Cermak, John Cermak O'Brien. Um, well, in terms of the whole art industry, competition, I would say, is everywhere, right? So what I'm doing is I'm majoring in communication and minoring in graphic arts. That way I can have more knowledge and expertise on the marketing portion and getting your name out there, right? So as you mentioned earlier, having your own business having someone that hired you actually become your client so you continue to work with them. I thought that was really smart. And that is something I think I would like to do more of in this business, I would say. Um, mixed more with like public relations and advertising type deals, I would say. Um, I have to ask how, when it came to like getting your name out, right? I know there's some luck involved but when it comes to like targeting certain individuals and industries how would you go about that per se like in a way it doesn't really rely on luck more so actually being able to directly market to them with like intention you have right. any right yeah yeah so um so you're absolutely right i mean i think in, in any in any field even sports um you know there is a degree of luck that one could sort of look at but um luck is one of those things you can't control and some people don't even believe in it um i have a um opinion about luck that it's really it's really like luck doesn't really exist in, in my in my mind. I think it really is a, a combination of actually being prepared for an opportunity when it arrives and also pursuing opportunities relentlessly so that you're never really relying on one single result um, to, to help you to help you like achieve your goal in life. And just to be more clear on what I mean, Let's say you're applying for grants as an artist, right? Now, there could be hundreds of people applying for the same grant. You know, the, per the people or the person that gets the grant, you know, you could say that they were somewhat lucky, right? Because like ultimately there has to be a decision made and out of the pool of people that have applied, if they're only gonna choose one person or two people, you could say that those, that person has a degree of luck. But frankly, obviously they had to have some sort of like, you know, strong out application in order to have been selected. Um, so I try not to use luck in situations where I know a lot of it has to do with perhaps presentation or skill. Um, but, to some, but to some extent, if you're an artist who is applying for grants and you're applying for grants all the time, meaning you don't let two weeks go by without applying for something, you're actually shifting the odds in your favor because you have so many potential things out there, so many possibilities of a yes, that even when you get a rejection letter, you're still waiting on 30 other responses. So a single rejection letter doesn't really impact you as emotionally, because it's not the only thing you have out there. It's not the only iron you have in the fire, right? And I, and I approach things in that way as well. Yes, there are things that I want to do that are like a singular thing, and it would be great if it happened. And if it doesn't happen, I'm bummed out. But I also approach things even to this day from the perspective of, I wanna be pursuing five or six things so that if only one of them happens, that's okay. And the other five that didn't happen, I can just like let it roll off my, my back like as if it wasn't a big deal. Even if it was kind of a big deal, I can still just like psychologically say to myself, I'm not gonna put all of my eggs in one basket. But not to get too far away from your question about you know marketing oneself and sort of making kind of connections with people. Um, I think that, first of all, there are a lot of people out there at a similar stage in their career. Um, and I know that there is value in sort of reaching up, so to speak, and trying to connect with people who are further along in a particular area than I am. But I also think there's a lot of value in building strong alliances with people who are also on their way up, just like you. Many of the people that I do the most business with today are people that I was still starting off doing business with five, six years ago. 
Um, and we've just kind of grown together over the years, right? I have a project, I pull them into it. They have a project, they pull me into it. They see an opportunity, they tell me about it. I see one, I tell them about it. And you build this sort of like network of people. I think it's important to surround yourself with people who want to see you succeed, but also people who you want to see succeed. I, I think that's like a very important part, even when you're just starting out, you know? The yeah. other thing is, if you can get your foot in the door, in any situation, uh, even at the lowest level, I think it's just worth doing it because meeting people, nothing nothing trumps meeting people, like actually meeting people. It's better than DMing them. It's better than cold email. It's better than a phone call out of the blue. Actually meeting someone is the way so many great things can happen. And you might meet them just because you're, you're a paid intern somewhere or you're a studio assistant or your, you know, whatever that level is, you have to put yourself in a position to meet people and to connect with people. Um, and lastly, I'll say this, a lot has changed in the past decade or so as it relates to how people can position themselves in the media. I mean, clearly anyone can start a YouTube channel. Anyone can get a IG account. We all know this, right? This is like obvious. And because of that, there's so much of that stuff out there, right? But even though it's like a sea of competition and it's almost impossible at, at first blush, it's impossible sometimes to know the difference between someone who's legitimate and someone who isn't. I still believe that all of these media outlets actually are tools that you can use to build relationships with people. I was listening to a podcast not so long ago and I thought one of the things the guy said on the podcast was really smart. It's pretty obvious, but it's really smart. And I actually, it's something that I employed decades ago when I was just getting started out in business. And what he said was, you know, if you, if you send an email to someone and say, hey, I wanna do business with you, they're probably gonna ignore you. But if you send an email to someone and you say, and again, some caveats here, I'm not talking about emailing Bill Gates or like, I'm talking about, you know, like terrestrial, not like, <laughs> not like you're gonna send a, send a yeah, message. Yeah, of course. You get what I'm saying. Um, you email someone and you say, hey, I'm writing a story about this particular subject. Uh, well, what he said was, if you send the email to someone and you say, I'd love to have you on my podcast for 15 minutes to talk about this subject, the odds of you getting a, a response are, are infinitely higher than if you were just asking someone to have coffee with you or to allow you to quote unquote, pick their brain, right? Because even seasoned business people are looking for opportunities to connect with new audiences. And so I think that if you can offer that to someone, it's a way to get, it's a way to get their attention and get your foot in the door. And again, I get it. It's not gonna work every time, but I think finding creative ways to connect with people that is not just a cold email and not just a DM is really, really important. Uh, if there's someone you want to meet and connect with, you need to read the things that they've written if they're a writer or study the things that they've said so that when you do have an opportunity to interact with them, you can say something to them that is smart and specific to them so they understand that you've taken the time to kind of get to know a bit about them. Um, but no matter where you are in your career, I also think that there's still something you can bring to the table, even if you're trying to connect with someone who you think is much further along in their career than you are. All right, that makes sense. So just know what you want to target and then motivate yourself, get yourself in the door, know who to reach out to and whatnot. Yeah, and, and lastly, because I would like to hear from others as well, but lastly, I'll also say, say this to you. You, you, you know, you can, you, you know, you can start your business. If you wanted to start a business in graphic design or graphic communications or whatever it is, I mean, you can start that business today, right? You know, like honestly, and your first clients could be people who are just starting out and just need the skills set that you have, whether they need it's a logo design or whatever it is. I just think that like the barrier to getting something off the ground is much lower than most people realize, but it's the commitment to stick with it and make it grow. That's the hard part to me. That's the hard part. So uh, Melissa, love to hear like what you're, what you're doing and, and, and challenged with. Um, well, since I'm graduating this year, it's kind of like 
getting on me like I'm kind of like facing the reality of like after this I have to figure out what I'm going to do so I actually applied to like a lot of jobs on like indeed.com or whatever and I wasn't thinking that I was going to get like any kind of offers or what like at all for my graphic design application but um I just like went for it because I didn't have anything to lose so I think like now I kind of have a plan because I want to intern in a large company, but I want to start small. So um, where like the job that I'm applying to, I actually got the job, which I was kind of surprised, but the job was like a graphic designer, like t-shirt processor, like a screen printing thing. It's so small, but I think that's just a good start for me to like actually get to know the process and I don't have much experience but the guy said I had a good attitude so that's why I was hired so I think that it was luck for me because that's something I want to do like in the future like actually make my own like um like does like printing kind of screen printing press thing so I think that after this I won't like after like working there and learning stuff I can like make my own kind of business out of that and kind of go from there after what you told me about the business aspect of it so like I'm kind of like hopeful that I can make something out of it but I don't really know a lot right now but it's I mean I have like a step after this like I can actually do something over the summer and learn a lot from the job I'm going to get now. Yeah, I mean, no one knows a lot when they're starting out in anything. So I think that that's like a completely reasonable, um, you know, position to be in. But, you know, like I, like I said, you know, being in the room, even if it's a small room, being in the room is really important. And also having that attitude, that good attitude and being open to projects and even small opportunities, I think is, you know, really important. Yeah is you just never, ever know. Even, you know, sometimes you also have to do something that you're not terribly enthusiastic about. And as a, I'll give you an example. In 2006, when I was right at that point where I didn't want to do PR and, and marketing in the way that I had been doing it any longer, I really wanted to focus more on a different space. I was given the, uh, I, had, I was invited um, to the Savannah College of Art and Design um, actually um, on their, their Atlanta campus in 2006 to give a talk about, the, the, I think the title of the talk was how to start a business in the fashion world or starting a business in the fashion world or something like that. And I was completely unenthusiastic about the, the, the invitation. Um, it just was not something that I wanted to talk about. But then I thought to myself, well, hey, what do I have to lose, right? They're gonna fly me down um, put me up in a hotel for a couple of nights and, you know, that ain't bad, you know, it's like that's, you know, whatever, you know, it was a small fee involved. Um, but because I said yes to that opportunity, I ended up meeting the, di the director of operations for the Savannah College of Art and Design during that trip. And we stayed in contact with one another. And as a result of that relationship, the Savannah College of Art and Design became my personal consulting client for nearly two years. Um, I was consulting that college and consulting their communications department and, you know, for a relatively, you know, good fee, but I was this close to not even saying yes to going down there. So you just never, you know, sometimes you have to just go for it, yeah. even if you're not sure. Yeah, um, like he kind of, when I was like being interviewed, he kind of was like, I'm surprised that you like applied because they required some sort of like Adobe, like illustrator, like work or something. So I had to like come in and bring in my stuff. Um, and then he came, called me for a second interview and that was like, he's like, you weren't really experienced, but the only reason I hired you, well, not the only reason, but that was something he wanted was illustrator experience, but I didn't have a lot. Um, he said, because of my attitude and other applicants didn't have that. So I thought 
that was just like the only time I actually went out for something and I don't know now that I know that it works kind of I'm gonna like maybe do that a lot more yeah I mean and who knows you know you may be with this company for a year you might be there two years you might mm -hmm. be there six months you know that that remains to be seen but I think it's it is about just taking this experience for what it is right it's a, it's a opportunity for experience um mm -hmm. so yeah yeah Edward what about you uh hi uh, I'm um I'm a marketing student I'm a senior here at St. Peter's and uh I resonate with a lot of the things you said um I've always kind of had like an appreciation I've, I've been saying this a lot this semester it's kind of like getting old but I've had like an appreciation and like um an appreciation for art through like animation and cartoons since I was a kid but I've always been on like the outside consuming it and like in the past couple of years I've been like I want to start you know being a part of the creation process so when I saw this class it seemed like a great opportunity to you know see the about where I could put um I think I mentioned I'm a marketing student but and I, I have a lot of respect for the skill of marketing itself. So I really wanted to mix those two things. And, but um, the thing I've been having trouble with is uh, I keep looking for the right opportunity. And I you kind of answered the question already. And I just have to like go for an opportunity in itself. I want to like have like really valuable learning experiences and like mentorship experiences. Cause I really want to, I really want to master the skills. I don't really just want to be like a part of anything. I want to master marketing itself. I want to master a lot of the skills and that's the thing I feel like is holding me back because I'm looking for a lot of technical experience before I enter the field when I should be in the field gaining the technical experience is what I've been hearing a lot. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I that makes sense to me. I mean, I, I feel like a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to prepare themselves to do something only to find that once they start doing it, A, they weren't prepared even though they thought they were, number one, right? And then B, all of the information that they were looking for, they could have learned that information by actually doing the thing, as opposed to trying to be prepared for something. Like sometimes you just have to like jump in, um, you, you know, and whether that's in the arts or, or other fields, I mean, clearly there are some fields that you don't just jump in, you don't just jump into being a surgeon. Um, <laughs> I would hope not, I guess you could, not in this country, that one uh, <laughs> but I and in other fields where um, you're going to learn a lot more by actually doing something than researching it. You have to just kind of get into it. You know, you can read about, for example, painting. You can read about painting for 10 years, but if until you pick up a brush and actually start painting, there's a limit to how much you actually understand about painting. Um, and there's so many other way, other analogies you can make to that. So, I mean, I think it's just like, you know, you know, good that you're taking the time now to take that more serious and think about, you know, getting past like theory and actually getting into like doing things, you know? Um, so yeah, I think that, that that's great. Um, Karina. I just want to say, um, thank you for coming. And what you just said, um, to Edward is exactly what I, I'm experiencing as well like I'm the type of person to before I like jump into a job I want to like be experienced and know what I'm doing rather than just going in there and like not knowing I feel like it's just better um more appealing for um people who are hiring um and that's also my mindset but right now um I'm a visual arts major and I'm minoring in business management and I really enjoy being an artist but as you were saying, it's really tough to, you know, make a career out of something, especially with just like one thing you study for. So I guess my challenge is trying to come up with other alternatives and not just think like, oh, artist, like that's, that's all I have. That's all I can be. Um, and lately I've been, you know, looking and thinking about the curator uh, curating world. Um, I kind of like it. And um, I want to dive deeper into that um, as an option for me. And I wanted to ask you, in your experience, what is like your, you talk about coming up with creative ideas. And I wanted to know what is your thought process when you feel the need that you need to come up with something creative? Because I feel like um, when I want to think about, oh, what's my next move? I really take my time 
and thinking what's my next move and you know I just wanted to see what's your thought process and compare it to mine yeah I mean um well it's a good question I don't think anyone has ever asked me that question exactly not exactly like that so good that's a good question um a couple things um because I have spent a lot of time thinking about how, let's say, consumers or an audience thinks about the experience of, of looking at an object or purchasing an object or, or, or having you know, some interaction with a, with a product or a thing, I often will ask myself, whenever I have an idea or looking for an idea, what are people interested in? And what will what would get someone excited other than myself? Even when I'm thinking about an exhibition, if if I have a sort of like a kernel of an idea uh, for an art exhibition that I want to organize, right? The first thing I try to do is to think about who who's gonna care? Like who's really gonna like give a damn about this idea besides me. Like I'm excited about it, but who, who's the audience for this? And then, and, and not that I'm creating things just for other people with them in mind, it's also for myself in mind, but I'm also thinking about it from the standpoint, if I'm approaching a gallery or if I'm approaching a museum and I'm pitching a show, I need to be able to convince them that there is an audience of people out there that are gonna want to come and see them. And so what I tend to do is I think about broader issues that are happening in pop culture, broader issues that are happening politically. They don't even have to be serious things that are happening politically. I try to look at um, you know, what people are talking about, even if it's things that make me roll my eyes that I'm not particularly interested in. I still try to look at it and figure out what is it about that that's so dynamic and is there a way for me to tap into that and bring it into the conversation that I'm attempting to have with this gallery or this institution about this particular show. Um, and so, you know, for me, I know that everyone has ideas and I've seen a lot of ideas that I would consider not be necessarily great ideas, get a lot of attention, a lot of traction. And that can sometimes make you feel a bit disappointed because you're like, wow, that doesn't even seem like a great idea. Why are people paying so much attention to it? But I also recognize that the way something is communicated and the amount of excitement that the marketing around it can generate can sometimes be more important than the actual thing itself. And the thing itself almost becomes like a vessel for all of this other hype. And I'm not advocating for that. I'm just simply saying that there's, there's so many examples in the art world and beyond of things that we would probably all unanimously agree looking at, it's not particularly a special object, but it's the writing that's been done about it. It's the people that have been associated with it. It's the machine that's behind it that makes everyone feel like this thing is imbued with so much importance. So when I'm thinking about my own idea process, I try to imagine how I'm gonna answer those kinds of questions. Like to be totally frank, I ask myself, who's gonna care? And how can I make people care about this? And what, what, what kind of language do I need to use to express my idea so that if I'm talking to a room of a hundred people, at least 80 or 90 of them are gonna go, yeah, I get that, that's exciting. That's, that's, that's what people are interested in right now. And again, I know some people go in the opposite direction. They just wanna have this sort of like, really highly intellectual, very narrow academic conversation with a handful of people who've read a certain kinds of books and have seen certain kinds of films um, and that's their audience. And that's, that's fine for them. Um, but for me, I'm more interested in connecting with a broader audience. And so I, I, I try to, just case in point, case in point, and I, and I won't spend too much more time in this because we're getting short on time. Um, when I decided to launch Artwall Conference, it was, it was really after a few years of having conversations with artists that were all sort of generally the same conversation, right? Um, you know, it's tough to balance having a studio and, and paying for my apartment. Um, it's tough to get representation. Um, it's difficult to find collectors. It's hard to market myself. Like you hear all these things and it became clear to me 
that there needed to be a platform out there that could help artists get this kind of information, right? The other thing, and I'll end with this from what you said, is that it's totally reasonable to be a serious artist and also have another job. Like most of the artists I know have a job that is not also making art. They're, and then not just teaching, there's all sorts of other jobs. And I think that it's, um, it's probably a misconception that you are less of an artist if, if you're not just making art. I think that's a complete and utter misconception. Um, because what that misconception, what, it, what that sort of uh, perpetuates is this concept that if, if galleries or collectors haven't validated you, then what you're doing isn't important. And that's not true at all. Uh, and there's so many different ways to have a career as an artist. And for some artists, if you sell one piece a year, two pieces a year, that's totally fine. You know, you're, you're, you're getting fulfillment out of making your work, even if you have a long-term goal that might be like bigger and better success. I just think that it's totally reasonable to continue being an artist also while you're doing other things. Yeah, that's exactly what I want to do. Like, I want to do art and things, but I want to get like, you know, a job that, you know, can financially support me and you know, and I'll actually, you know, enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that makes total sense. Total sense. So, Bernard, how about you? Uh, what's up? Um, I am a sophomore and a graphic design major, and I do a lot of different creative stuff. Um, I spend, or like lately, the, I think, from last summer I spent most of my time on clothing so like I've uh, I do a lot of clothing design and I have a, a clothing brand in Norway and then I have uh, um, I do like fine art stuff on the side and then also uh, a bit of graphic design stuff for people in Norway as well and uh, but then as I said like the last year it's been like my, most of my time has been spent on clothing uh because it's just been I was supposed to launch like our first factory made collection in December and then uh, because of like COVID and everything happening it's just been taking so much time so it's just been postponed and then it's not probably gonna happen until this summer so it's been difficult and then obviously I, I was just uh, when I was listening to Edward and uh, Karina about like they're talking about how they like want to I don't know like not investigate but trying to like educate themselves before they step into a new thing I'm like the complete opposite I just like I'm like I step into something and then I try to learn it and um, like for example with the clothing part as well it's just that's the way it's been because like I didn't have any or like it started off by making like sewing and like painting on clothes. And then uh, we got it on a lot of uh, Norwegian artists and like famous people in Norway. So it like popped off. And then uh, after that, like trying to do like the factory stuff as well. And then obviously I didn't have any like factory connections. I didn't know anything about like the marketing stuff. So like for the past year, I've just been working a lot on trying to educate myself on how to like market properly Google ads, how to get in touch with influencers, different factories, uh, changing factories a couple of times because we had first one in Turkey and then we had to change to Portugal. Like it's been just very interesting. Like obviously I don't have anything but samples at this, but then again, I've like, I've learned so much. Uh, but it's frustrating as well though, when it's just like you, you work a lot and you put a lot of effort into it and then you kind of still have the belief that it's going to work and like I think it is but at the same time like you're not seeing the finished product yet but then again as you uh, mentioned earlier you were talking about like having uh, multiple eggs in the basket or something like that and then that's why I'm trying like I, I play soccer uh, at the college and then I also do like the graphic design and the fine art stuff so I just uh, got into a new gallery in Norway and then like you have like small victories in other places when you're like not succeeding in, or I wouldn't say it's not succeeding, but it's just like, you're not seeing the, um, uh, the, um, 
you know you're not like hitting the target as quick as you wanted to in like one yeah, field I, and you I could like yeah I, I definitely um think that's 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 good i mean you know um we all have well hopefully we all have goals and sometimes you know depression can 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 set in when you feel like you've just been grinding at something for so long and it's just like why is it taking so long to make progress and i think a, a way of like self care and therapy is having something else that you're doing that you can see the results in um whether it's daily or weekly to make you realize that you know progress is possible even if it's not progress in that particular area but yeah you know to the to the point of like jumping into things feet first before you know how they operate i mean i you know again i'm not i'm not necessarily saying one way is is, is explicitly better than the other i think that in some instances um it's better to be more cautious and then in others i think you can jump in and so for example and i want to get to jeremy as well but just like give me an example of what i'm talking about I would never advocate that someone without without knowledge just jump feet first into real estate investing. It's like don't just don't. That's just not something you should do. I mean, like <laughs> you, that, that you know you can jump foot first into starting a clothing brand. Sure, sure. Not that that doesn't require skill and 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 business know how, but you know you don't jump feet first into like taking out a million dollar loan to renovate an abandoned building and you've never even done anything in real estate before you know it's like i think there's certain places where you need to be a bit cautious um but um you know there are always these examples and i'm sure there probably probably would be some real estate people we could find on youtube that would be like dexter you don't know what you're talking about i <laughs> i've taken out all sorts of loans before i knew what i was doing but you get my point i i just think that um you got to weigh the weigh the risk Right. There's very little risk in, you know, starting a small company that you're funding yourself and hoping to make it grow. Right. That the risk is you can calculate the risk. The risk is that's time that you're not spending working for someone else and getting a paycheck if you're putting the time there. So that's the risk you're taking. Right. Whereas some of the other things that require a lot of upfront money, you want to like really better understand like what your tolerance is for for the risk. But I think, but at the age you guys are at now, with the resources you have at your disposal, um, don't be too cautious. That's what I would say. Don't be too cautious. You know, you 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 know, don't do anything reckless, but don't be too cautious. You have time to like make mistakes and recover. You have time to spend. You can spend three years thinking you have the best idea under the sun and then realizing that you just shouldn't be doing that anymore and you go in another direction. And that's just called life. That's just what it is. And I, that's if you're a graphic designer, if you're an artist or whatever, I think that that's totally fine. And one shouldn't, one shouldn't think that the way forward is to just have it all figured out without any uh, pivots or mistakes. Um, if I stood on my mistakes, that'd be 50 feet tall. You know, like I've made a lot of mistakes, but uh, I am what I am as a result of those mistakes and hopefully better for it. So Jeremy, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I hope you're still there. Hope you're not like making a cake somewhere and then like just have your like <laughs> your computer running. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Of like my goals and what I want to do. Yeah. Mm. My goal is to try and create sort of an original, like basically an original story, mainly a cartoon. So mm -hmm. I'm majoring for the graphic arts, but also minor, minoring and marketing. So I know how to advertise and sell it to others. Well, I mean, I, I think that um, getting in, just getting in and assisting someone that's already doing what you're doing I think in that kind of field is where I, I think the, is the way to go. You know, someone said to me recently, you know, uh, cause their daughter is pursuing a film career. Um, and, and they were like, you know, I just told her, learn how to be a good assistant editor because everyone always needs an editor. And if you can be a good assistant editor, then you're, you're gonna get work and you're gonna be in the room. And I think in, as it relates to what you're saying, if you're able to work with, even at a junior level, work with more established people who are in animation, um, to help them achieve 
their vision, then I think that opens up, you know, opens up the opportunity for you. I mean, like most directors that I've read about or that I even know personally, they were assistants for years. I mean, that's just like, I think that's just kind of almost what you have to do in order to get into certain fields. Like you just not, no one's just gonna like hand you a budget and be like, you know, make this or shoot this film. You've never done it before. You don't even know the people who are the players. So, I mean, I, I, not that you're necessarily asking me for that particular advice, but I just feel like getting started and doing it, but then also working with other more established people is a great way for you to, um, you know, get those connections. You know, that's, that's just what I think. So um, we're coming to the end here um, because I, ha I have to actually jump off at 3.30. So we're at like 3.26 now. Um, Trish, is there anything you else you want me to um, try to d cover before we're done? Um, let's see. Uh, I guess, can you just uh, maybe tell us uh, any of your like uh, most exciting uh, experiences you've had in the art world, like uh, just as far as uh, that you feel like it was just incredible. <laughs> I mean, um, probably there've been there've been a lot of really exciting experiences, but but I'll tell you what you know the the reason why I enjoy uh, working in the art world um, is a very very personal one, but. Um, It is as as a curator, and and someone who consults. It is absolutely impossible for me to do any project that only benefits me. Like so, if I if I organize an art exhibition, that's a collaboration between me, an artist or a group of artists, and maybe a gallery or a museum. If I am working with a nonprofit on a project, then I'm collaborating with those people and we have a set goals and we're attempting to get there. There is almost nothing I do that is solo, right? And, and as a result of that, I feel, I think it's really rewarding to know that I'm constantly like helping other people achieve their goals while I'm also pursuing my own goals. And that's just like really a really important thing to me because even when I think back to the beginning of my, my career as a curator um, where I wasn't making, and first of all, let's just be clear, independent curators do not make a lot of money. So let's, let's be clear there. So I do a lot of different things and I've started companies because of that fact too. <laughs> you know, I have a family. Um, but even in the beginning of my career, um, it was important that the work that I was doing wasn't just a manifestation of my own ideas, that it was also my giving a platform for the ideas of other people to see the light of day. And so for me, as difficult as the art world can be as a community because of all of the, you know, everything is politicized or racialized or whatever it is. It's like, it's a very strange time right now. I still find it to be very rewarding because I can literally see um, the results of my work. Like I, I can see someone go from not being known to being known, not being in collection to being in a collection to not being able to pay their bills to having representation and now they can pay their bills. Like I, I can, I, I see it. Um, and you don't really see things that so clearly in a lot of other uh, industries that you can just spend years working in. And it's just like, I don't know, what did we just do today? I don't know, maybe did we, did we build another app? Perhaps we did, okay, great. Now, how many people downloaded it? I don't know. You know, like I'm not, not to malign tech cause I'm sort of in the tech world in, in, in some way as well, but you get my point. It's a very personal hands-on uh, relationship driven uh, business, but that sometimes makes it a little bit more difficult as well. So, yeah. So anyway, I have really appreciated um, our conversation today. Uh, you might have heard that, but that 3.30 call actually just came in. Um, so thank you guys uh, for giving me your ears for an hour. And I hope that something I said helped 
you answer a question that you might have had in some way. Thank you, Dexter. It was so kind Thank of you. Me. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Dexter. Right, guys. Take care. Have a great day. Right, Thanks guys. again, Trish. Take care. Thank you.